The first day of the Olympic Festival began with a swearing-in ceremony for the participating athletes, trainers, and judges. The ceremony took place in front of the altar of Zeus Horkios, or Zeus of the Oath. Athletes would swear that they would follow the Olympic rules while judges promised to be fair and unbiased. Then the competitions began, starting with a contest between heralds and trumpeters over who would have the privilege of announcing the games. The first day's athletic competitions consisted of wrestling, running, and boxing events for the youngest athletes, aged 12 to 18. The second day began with a grand procession into the Hippodrome to celebrate the start of the popular equestrian events. The most anticipated and spectacular of these was the Quadriga, a four-horse chariot race. Horse racing events were unique in that the winner was not the most skilled jockey, but the owner of the fastest horse or chariot. The Spartan princess Kaniska once took advantage of this loophole to skirt the rule that women weren't allowed to compete and earned two Olympic victories in the process. The rule also allowed for occasionally strange results, like in 416 BCE, when the statesman Alcibiades entered seven chariots into a race and won first, second, and fourth place. After the equestrian competitions, the 40,000 spectators migrated to the stadium to watch the pentathlon events. When the day's events were over, funeral rites were performed for the hero Pelops, the mythical founder of the Olympic Games. The night ended with a celebratory feast and a great parade in honor of the day's victors. Victory at the Olympic Games was one of the highest honors a mortal could achieve, and there were several ways to immortalize that honor. Some athletes had statues erected of themselves, while others commissioned poets to write them victory odes. Oral tradition was very important to the Greeks. These odes, called epinikia, were often composed by the finest poets in the land, such as Pindar, Simonides, and Bacchylides. They were usually played at banquets and celebrations attended by the triumphant athlete or upon his departure from Olympia. The pentathlon took place at the stadium on the second day. As its name implies, it was made up of five events, discus throwing, javelin throwing, jumping, racing, and wrestling. There are several differences between the ancient version of events and their contemporary counterparts. For example, ancient long jumpers held weights in their hands to give them momentum to launch, since there was no run-up before the jump. Similarly, if an athlete won the first three events, they were immediately declared the winner, instead of being judged by their overall performance in all five events. Running events work the same as they do today, with the notable exception of all the athletes being nude. As for wrestling, competitors were not divided by weight class as they are today, but instead by age. The winner was the first to throw his opponent to the ground three times. Day three started with the most important event of the festival. A procession of Helenodikai, ambassadors, competitors and animals, made their way to the great altar in front of the Temple of Zeus. The animals were then offered as the official sacrifice of the festival. The afternoon of day three was dedicated to foot racing events. Running was the oldest event of the games, and in fact was the only event at the first Olympics. The main race was called the Stadion, which was a sprint of around 180 meters. The winner was granted the honor of lending his name to the four-year period between the games, this period was known as the Olympiad. The four years that followed the first games in 776 BCE were known as the Olympiad of Coroibus of Elis, the first Olympic champion. Once all the competitions were over, a public banquet was held in the Pretineon to celebrate the day's victors. Day four was mainly for combat events. Wrestling matches were held in the morning, followed by boxing and pancration. Pancration was a no-holds-barred mix between wrestling and boxing. Almost all moves were permitted, except for biting, poking the eyes or mouth, and striking the genitals. The event was very popular, and it was seen as the ultimate expression of strength and technique. Later on in the afternoon, there was a unique racing event called the Hoplitodromos, or race in armor. In this event, competitors wore a helmet and held a shield to simulate running in the battlefield.
The Hellenodikai, or judges of the Greeks, were both the game's adjudicators and their organizers. They hailed from Elis, the city in charge of the sanctuary of Olympia, and new judges were elected each Olympiad. They had several responsibilities. Before the game started, they decided which athletes would be allowed to compete and supervise their training. They also drew lots to make the competition brackets. During the games themselves, they picked the winners and kept an eye out for foul play. For the latter, they were assisted by stick and whip-wielding umpires who stood near the athletes and punished them if they were caught cheating. Victory in Olympia was one of the most prestigious honors in all of Greece. Not only would victors be showered in glory in their home city, but their names would be known across Greece. The temptation to glory led some athletes to break their oath to Zeus and cheat. This could be dangerous, as there were many possible punishments should cheaters be caught. They could be disqualified and fined, or if they were caught cheating during a match, they would be beaten by nearby umpires. The most powerful deterrent of cheating, however, was shame. At the foot of Mount Kronios and on the way to the stadium were a group of bronze statues called Zanes, the plural of Zeus. These statues were inscribed with the names of the cheating athletes, how they cheated, and the fine that was imposed. The Zanes, which were funded by cheaters' fines, were strategically placed to be highly visible. Individuals or even entire cities could be found guilty of cheating. The Pretineion was the administrative center of the cult of Olympia and the Olympic Games. The building housed the sanctuary's priests as well as the game's officials. It was also used to stage the grand banquet held on the evening of the third day to honor victors. It also had a sacred function. Its central chamber was the location of the Fire of Hestia, a sacred flame that burned day and night. This fire was used to light the other altars around the sanctuary. This practice may have partially inspired the modern tradition of carrying the Olympic torch.